Good morning, Baristanians. This morning we're going to talk about redundancies. Well, it's morning for me, it'll be evening when you see this, because that's how the internet works, at least for us. Um, I'll begin with a little bit of a story about uh, life on the homestead this morning, and that perhaps will illustrate why redundancies when it comes to preparedness are important. A preparedness or <clears throat> anything that's... Um, important to you, be that the completion of a project or a task or surviving the end of the world as we know it. So this morning, it's a balmy 15 degrees uh, above freezing Fahrenheit, which is awesome because for approximately the last week here in eastern Oklahoma, it has been zero or below. I believe it was negative 20 ish uh with the wind chill a few days ago and i know some people are in the wind chill some people aren't but um when your boogers are freezing in your nostrils because the wind is whipping at 30 miles an hour and you have to feed the sheep i, I care about the wind chill it matters to me so very cold colder than the infrastructure here in eastern oklahoma is built for for example our rural water line is buried 10 to 12 inches below the ground now, if you're from the northern tier, like I was growing up, you know, hey man, that thing needs to be like 32 inches below ground. Nah, they don't do that here. Why would you? It's Oklahoma. <sighs> yeah. So, this morning, uh, 15 degrees, wake up and um, go to the gym, 4.30 in the morning. Coming back from the gym, my trusty, reliable GMC Sierra 3500 HD goes into low power mode. That's fun. Limp back to the house, do a little bit of research, turns out it's the throttle positioning sensor. Also throw in a code for the mass airflow sensor. Fun times, order that while I'm doing my business on the toilet, you know, multitasking, right? And um, so, truck's down, good times. Do my business on the toilet, go to flush, toilet clogs. Why does the toilet clog? <clears throat> well, our water's been out here as of the time of this recording for four days. Our rural water. Uh, water lines froze up. Uh, in fact, the main water line coming from the rural water meter to the house uh, exploded underneath the house. So we have that line shut off. Okay. Well, now it appears the uh, sewer line is froze up as well. Yay good times. Okay. Pivot, <laughs> improvise, adapt, overcome, right? So deal with that. We'll just leave it at that. Deal with that, that mess. It's fun times. Um, but luckily one of our frost free spigots still works. So get some water cans, fill the water cans up, top off the Berkey, made a pot, make a pot of coffee, fill the toilet tanks on the two flush toilets back up. Time to do chores. Well, my son um, was trying to fire up one of the four-wheelers in order to go feed the sheep. Good job, boy. Except he had the choke set wrong. And uh, being a 14-year-old young man is prone to impatience and killed the battery trying to start the four-wheeler. Because again, unlike the Northern Tears, and I promise you there's, there's lessons in here for you. We'll get there in a moment. Unlike the Northern Tiers, we don't have a barn or a shop building to park our vehicles inside of. We will. <laughs> it's on the list. After five winters here, it's on the list. So, four-wheelers down. Trucks down. Now what do we do? Aha. Second four-wheeler to the rescue. Get the other four-wheeler fired up. Cross-load from the one four-wheeler that's down four-wheeler one that's down go feed the sheep come back to the house fire up the skid steer so i can push brush into a burn pile from trees that we took down yesterday get my steaming hot cup of coffee come out here to the team room so i can talk with y'all so redundancies are important um Making a note for myself. 
So let's look at transportation. Here's some areas for you. Transportation, water, food, security, commo, shelter, power, medical, intel, etc. Where it would behoove you, and it has behooved us, to have redundancies. I think most people approach preparedness, surviving the end of the world as we know it, man, from a standpoint of trying to be as comfortable as possible when the poo hits la ventilator, right? Comfort is probably not something that you're going to be able to sustain at the same level that you experience now while the system is still chugging along. And so mitigating discomfort is one way to approach preparedness, but I think deepening capability is another more practical way to approach preparedness. Four-wheeler two is not as big or as powerful as four-wheeler one, but it worked. And four-wheeler one is not as big or as powerful as truck, but truck wasn't working, right? So simply from a transportation standpoint, I have my truck. It's a great truck. It runs wonderfully, except for when it doesn't. Parts are inbound to being picked up by Mama Bear this morning. Got a brother coming over to help me work on it. It'll be up and running by this afternoon. No biggie, right? But it doesn't work right now. And are you going to be able to go to the parts store when the balloon goes up? Probably not. Okay. But Mama's car still works. Awesome. So there's some redundancy, right? Four-wheeler one. Not working. Battery's dead. Oh, and by the way, the battery jump box. Sitting in the driveway next to my daughter's car. Completely dead. So it's plugged up and charging now too, right? But four-wheeler two started because it's mechanical, right? Praise the Father, four-wheeler two started. So there's some redundancy there. If it didn't start, skid steer? Could I use the skid steer to feed the sheep? Mm-hmm. Is it the best use of our precious resources, including fuel after the balloon goes up? No. But will that 12,000-pound tracked behemoth get back there to the sheep? Because they're in the back, back, back field right now. Yeah, for sure, it would. What if I didn't want to use the skid, store or I, skid steer or I didn't have one? How about a garden cart? Love garden carts. Uh, we have several. Pro tip, upgrade the tires from your standard tube air tires to run flats. Either solid rubber or they make some that have like little holes drilled in the side of them. No, whatever. Solid rubber wheels. 10-inch, uh, 12-inch wheels because they don't go flat. And we've had that experience in the past. And they're like 10 bucks a wheel or something. So it's not prohibitively, prohibitively expensive. But garden cart, I could load you know, hay and water and feed for the sheep on the garden cart. And I could drag it a half a mile, mile from here to where the sheep are. I could do that, right? Um, what about a bicycle? Mm, it'd be tough for feeding the sheep, but it could get you around. And last but not least, your LPCs, your leather personnel carriers, your feet. I could absolutely walk my happy ass back there and feed those sheep. I didn't, but I could. And even then, redundancy, how many extra pairs of boots do you have? Are they good boots? Are they broken in? Socks, etc. right? What about water? So the county water's froze up. Our wells aren't. We have three wells. We also have water storage. We also have multiple water points, right? We have hose spigots and frost freeze and well heads and yada, yada, yada. So we have IBC, uh, International Bulk Container Water Storage. We've got 2,000 gallons of water, which even though it's 15 degrees outside because of the volume of water is not froze up inside of the IBC totes. And we've got a bunch of six gallon jerry cans not froze up either. So that's cool. But in your house, do you have bottled water? Do you have canned water? You know, when it got this cold, when it first got this cold, we knew it was going to get this cold. So we started filling buckets and pots to have water in the house. Because yes, we can carry water from outside the house, but it's way easier to get it out of the tap, right? So we did, and we've been using that. Another really good, really cheap option is the water bob. B-O-B, -B, Water Bob. You can find them on Bezos' fifth yacht. 
and they're like 40 bucks and you put it in your tub and when you know you're going to have a storm or it's going to get below freezing and your infrastructure is not built for below freezing you fill it up in your tub and it'll hold as many gallons as your tub does 60 80 100 gallons and it's got a little hand siphon on top of it so you can pump back out of it it's a big plastic bag with a hand siphon on it you can pump out of the tub into your buckets right so recommend having a couple of water bobs on hand if you live you know residential if you have a tub then why not use the tub right so water bob you could fill your tub now, i would you know depending on how clean your tub is probably don't want to drink out of it but you could filter it you could boil it you could use it for hand washing flushing toilets etc um we also have a pool the reason we have a pool is not because not just because my wife wanted one not just because I enjoy look, gazing upon my wife in a bikini. Facts, man. It's just facts. It's because it holds 8,400 gallons of water. And while there's a layer of ice on top of the pool, it ain't froze solid. So, there's water in the pool. And that's why I approved it. You know, happy wife, bikini, definitely contributing factors. But an additional 8,400 gallons of water storage approved and praise the most high we have creeks on property as well and while there's ice on the top of the creek the water's still flowing underneath it so if i had to life or death situation i could get water out of the creek in fact i have a brother whose his water lines froze up he lives near us and uh he was walking down to the creek to dump or dip buckets into the water to bring water back up to his house so that he could do dishes and flush toilets and all that stuff so creeks rock what about food well, you have your fridge, right? Eat what's in your fridge. Uh, and a lot of people talk about, well, what happens in a grid down situation? Eat what's in your fridge first, right? Get as many of those calories in before they spoil. And then your freezer, right? Most of us have freezers, um, either attached to your fridge or separate standalones. We have two chest freezers. We had three, but one of them broke. And in the age of COVID, getting another freezer is prohibitively expensive if you can find them. So we're dealing with two right now. So eat your fridge, then eat your freezer. And then, right, most people have a short-term pantry, whether this is a pantry uh, cabinet in your kitchen, or it's a hallway closet, or it's a closet off of your kitchen, whatever, right? What we call pantry one. We have a kitchen cabinet pantry pantry one then pantry two we have a long-term three to six month inventory pantry in the house right pantry two see the redundancies here then you have your food storage your long-term food storage ideally this is a year or more of food um, and every time i read genesis 41 i'm like a year is a joke i think seven years is much better comma i completely understand that most people get scared when they hear seven years they're like I, i'm still we're gonna put up three months good put up three months and i've been prepping since hurricane katrina 15 16 years now this stuff doesn't happen overnight right they talk about redundancies look behind me I didn't buy all these on the same day. This is a lifetime collection, okay? So, <clears throat> this stuff doesn't happen overnight, but it doesn't mean it shouldn't happen, right? You should constantly be working to improve your position. So then you have your long-term food storage. Ideally, a year or more. If you're rocking seven years, bless you. Good job. And then you got to look at, like, replenishment for your food. So this is gardens, um possibly foraging if you live in a place that is uh, has a low population density and a large amount of wild flora and fauna uh, hunting right and livestock hunting slash fishing and livestock although we know from historical data that when things get bad like a la the great depression uh, hunting and fishing was only short-term viable because the number of people who began to do that in order to provide calories for their household uh, increased greatly, skyrocketed, and so that put a lot more pressure on the local populations of game animals and game fish, and there wasn't a whole lot to go around. White-tailed deer and turkeys, uh, wild turkeys, 
were hunted to the brink of extinction during that period of time. And the only reason we have those animals today to hunt is because of conservation efforts that were made during that period to make sure that those herds and flocks weren't eradicated. Is a bunch of turkeys a flock? A gaggle? A murder? I don't know what you call a bunch of turkeys. Um, there are flocks if they're inside my uh, fence in the front yard. Got a flock of turkeys out there. They're a lot easier to hunt, too, when you get them in the corner of the fence. Yeah. Um, what about security? Redundancy here. Well, EDC, right? Your pistol, your reload, your flashlight, your tourniquet. What about your bump plan? Bump in the night plan, right? That kind of builds on the EDC. What do you grab when there's something that might need to be interdicted in the middle of the night? Um... Your line gear, line one, line two, line three, your war belt, your plate carrier, your rucksack, etc. And then building on that, your team, right? The the people you do hood rat shit with. The boogaloo man, if when the balloon goes up. So there's redundancies there as well. Camo, your pace plan, primary alternate contingency emergency. This is redundancy. And as a general rule, nobody gets outside the wire without a good pace plan. Right? How are you going to talk back to us when things go sideways? Because no plan survives contact with the enemy, right? So what's your combo plan, your pace plan? For us today, it's probably cell phone, right? Hey, JM, it's Bob. Just wanted to chat with you. What's going on, right? Um, and then if it's not calling or texting, how many people even call anymore? I know some, a lot of people do, but a lot of people text now, right? It's probably apps, right? Maybe your alternate is apps on your phone, like Signal or Zello or whatever else, right? And then maybe your contingency is RF radio frequency. Um, and perhaps, you know, like UHF, VHF, etc. And maybe perhaps emergency is your CB radio or your HF radio, right? And BT dubs, there's no such thing as secure combo, regardless if it's your cell phone or your radio um, or your app. It, it, there's no such thing as secure combo, so bear that in mind, right? And then for us, interestingly, because we're a peculiar people, we have shofars. Shofars. These are uh, trumpets, essentially, that are made out of animal horn, and they're loud, and they carry, and different notes and blasts and lengths mean different things the scope of which is outside the scope of this video. But you could think about whistles, perhaps, here. The dinner bell, great example. Dinner bell, tried and true tested camo plan. You want to eat, you better hear the dinner bell, right? You can call me anything you want as long as you don't call me late to dinner. How about shelter, redundancy, right? And again, concepts here. I just want you guys to be thinking about these things, and it would probably be worth you getting a sheet of paper and a pen, much like I did, and making yourself some notes as to what do your redundancies actually look like, right? Shelter, let's start with clothing. Um, I mentioned it's been really cold here, and yet and still, on the few occasions where I go out into the world, I see people who are wearing like a thin hoodie and Crocs. You're gonna die. If you leave the house when it's cold with that on, you're gonna die. And while I'm no fan of Darwin, I am a fan of natural selection. Perhaps if that's your, your wardrobe plan for when it's zero degrees outside, you shouldn't be procreating. And people make the argument, well, you know, that Origin hoodie's a hundred dollars. I can't afford that. This jacket, that was ninety dollars when you bought it five years ago or whatever. I can't afford that. Hey man, secondhand store. You get this jacket all day there for twenty bucks, right? You can get a hoodie for ten bucks. No shame in that game. Your clothes, right? So dressing appropriately before you step outside in the world. Your clothes this is portable shelter. Um, then your house, right? You have a house, probably, if you're watching this, you have a house or an apartment or whatever, like four walls and a roof, preferably a floor as well. You have a house. Next from there, a different house or more shelter somewhere else, also known as a BOL, bug out location. And lots of people bug out for lots of reasons, aside from the world has ended. You know, with Grindstone, we do... Um, 
disaster relief, tornadoes and hurricanes, those people bug out. They go to somebody else's house where the problem isn't, right? It's a bug out location. Uh, spider points, this is multiple bug out locations on a map, preferably in cardinal directions away from your house, north, south, east, west. So if you had multiple bug out locations, not necessarily a patch of land where I can go Abraham Lincoln mode on this land and build myself a shelter, but I have friends to the north, friends to the south, friends to the east, friends to the west. Hey, Mike, it's bear. If things get weird, can I come to your house? Oh yeah, of course, right? See what I mean? So spider points. Uh, your vehicle. Uh, you can live a great amount of time in a vehicle. I saw a comment from somebody recently on a video who said they're 72 years old and they spent six months in the national forest living out of their van and loved every moment of it. That's awesome. Super awesome. Um, your bug out bag, right? Your ranger roll, your wool blanket and your tarp, whatever you got, your, you know, EWCS, you know, your sleep system. Cool. There's shel There should be shelter. Um, that's part of cover, the five C's of survival in your bug out bag. And then maybe you do go Abe Lincoln mode. You go out to the woods and you're like, you know what? I've watched 4,200 Townsend's videos and I feel pretty comfortable with my axe and my sharpening stone building a structure out of these trees. Go for it, bro. Go for it. The problem with that, brief aside, is that most people think when they're bugging out that every time they stop to rest that they're going to build some type of intricate shelter, and that's a waste of time and calories, the two most precious things that you have while you're moving, because the reason we're bugging out is to get from where things are bad to where things are less bad and or good, right? So you're putting distance and time, which are synonymous with one another, in between you and the problem. So if you're stopping and burning time, and burning calories to build intricate shelters while bugging out. That's a waste of very precious resources. It also is an indicator if somebody's following you. If every time, right, every evening I come up on the debris hut or the uh, A-frame shelter you built the night before, first of all, thank you. I appreciate that. Second of all, I'm now tracking you, right? You're leaving indicators everywhere. So not, not recommended which is why you should have in your bug out bag a good shelter system whatever that looks like uh, what about power well we have the grid right what about uh, like a generator 5k 10k generator that should be professionally wired into your house or that you have identified key things in your house that you need to run on the generator and you have the extension cords to run from the generator to those appliances um, small scale solar like a jackery or something else like that you know that provides um, enough wattage output that you can keep cell phones charged maybe run a refrigerator or a freezer or whatever large scale solar again getting to redundancies um, a large array that has significant battery backup so that you can run your house for extended periods of time without the grid and I would add to that in some limited uh, instances, small scale wind as well, like an Xeris 442 10K or something like that. Um, or an old Bergie uh, 5K. Whatever. If it's windy enough there and you have the resources to invest into that, go for it, right? That's still backup generation, all of which is dependent upon batteries, right? Battery storage is really important for this. Uh, what about an inverter? I have a 750 watt inverter in my truck. So if the truck starts, getting back to the beginning of this conversation, <laughs> um, which it starts, it's just in low power mode. Very frustrating, GMC. Thank you so much. Bear, what's the best truck? I've broken all of them. <laughs> all of them. Um, I've done motors on Fords, transmissions on Chevys, and everything on Dodges. So... What about the Tundra? That's fine if you're a smaller person. I'm not. Anyway. Um, inverter. I have an inverter in my truck. And, and on and on and on. Right? You, can, you can and should play this game all the way down. All the way down. For your medical plan, right? From having a tourniquet in your back pocket to a bare fact in your vehicle to a 
stomp bag in your team room to a doctor or a nurse on your team, right? Like redundancy. Intel, how do you develop and correlate Intel, right? All these things you can and should do an inventory. Take a sheet of paper on your lunch break today, take a pen, sit down and just start thinking about all these different areas, transportation, water, food, security, communications, shelter, power, medical, intelligence, whatever else you may have, weaponry, right? And that goes to security. Most, but most people in the prepper sphere geek out about weaponry. I gotta have, I gotta have this thing with that thing, and I like the ten and a half inch barrel with the war comp on the end of it, and this and that, and then this can with this trigger, and uh, not a Peck 15. I much prefer to use a, and then I like a surefire vampire. Who cares? I, I don't care. I don't care. The fact of the matter is, for SHTF, for most of us, let alone those of us who live rurally, you know, out here where they got to pipe the sunshine in. And those pipes would probably freeze too because they're only a foot underground. Um, anything on this wall, one of them, it'd be fine. It don't matter. It don't matter. It matters that you know how to use it way more than it matters what it is. You know, you give me a 4570 lever gun. Okay, cool. Rally around the family, pocket full of shells, right? 12 gauge. 12 gauge, awesome. From nine shot up to one and a quarter ounce slugs, right? And everything in between. Fabulous. From squirrels to bull moose. Sounds good. Wonderful. Right? It don't matter. But people will focus on this because it it fulfills that immediacy, right? If you're in a deadly force engagement, the only thing that solves that problem is better, faster, harder, stronger deadly force, right? And so people hyper-focus on that. But that solves immediate problems, not long-term problems. Like, what are you going to eat? How are you going to wash your hands after you poo? Where are you going to poo? Et cetera. Right? Like, even that, we talked about the frozen toilets. Okay, well, praise the Most High. I have multiple toilets in my house. Also, praise the Most High. On the other side of this wall is a composting toilet in the outhouse. Right? So, do an inventory. And I'll end with a little story for you. When I was in the wind turbine industry, I was invited to bid a project on a remote island in the Caribbean. And I believe at the time there was like 10 people living on this island. And some major hotel corporation had found this little island and wanted to build a hotel and a restaurant and, you know, a tourist attraction there. The issue was the entire island was powered by a 40 kilowatt number two diesel generator. And so in order to have electricity, they had to bring in by ship, which is interesting because we'll get to the type of facilities they had in a moment. They had to bring in by ship diesel fuel. And even then, they would run the generator for an hour or two every day. And it would power up a very minimal grid on the island. And during that block of time, people charged their cell phones, you know, did their laundry, whatever, right? And that's it. That's how it worked. Well, that is not near enough power to run a hotel. And so um, the developer was interested in putting up wind because there was a lot of wind there. So they contacted us. I bid the job. There was no dock. I asked... I asked the um, the guy who was on site there, who, uh, there was a little restaurant, little restaurant, uh, and all their stuff came in on, on a boat. <laughs> I asked the guy there who they put me in contact with um, via telephone, can you send me a picture of the dock? So he emailed me a picture of the dock. It was about four and a half foot wide made of wood, maybe 30 yards long, and looked like if I stood on it, it might fall apart. Okay, that's not going to work. So we found this maritime company that had these big barges, almost like Higgins boats, where the front would flop open onto the shore, and then you could roll your stuff off. And So we started bidding the job. 
with some really interesting constraints. Um, you know, how many, the tonnage, how many tons can we fit on each barge? How many barge trips does it take in order to get onto the beach? What is the first thing that needs to come off the beach? The answer to that is two Caterpillar D8 dozers with winch lines on them so that we can get onto the beach, clear the scrub butt brush, establish a landing, and then use the winch and the winches and the dozers to start dragging other stuff off of the barges. And I'm talking, we got to make concrete, right, to put these things in the ground. So we got to bring a portable batch plant. We have to bring every ounce of cement that we need, a desalination plant so we can take water out of the ocean and turn it into potable water and, you know, uh, desalinated water to make, uh, conc make concrete with, um, generators, diesel fuel, down to the nuts, the nuts that you need to put on the bolts to stand the towers up. And I remember thinking it was like, I think it was 3,400 one-inch grade 8 nuts, nuts that we needed. I bid 10,000 of those, 10,000. They come in kegs, right, a keg of nuts. And then each keg... We didn't put all 10,000 nuts on one barge, right? Building redundancies into this is the point of the story. They were separate. There was like one keg of nuts on each barge. So if something goes down, something gets lost, like we still have enough nuts to do the job with. Um, because you don't just run to the Home Depot. There's no Home Depot. The boat that brought mail to the island came once a month. They would bring mail and flour and rice and, you know, alcohol and <laughs> all the other things that humanity takes to, to survive. Um, you know, I asked the guy at the little restaurant, I was like, so what's there to eat here? Fish. Cool. He goes, if you guys want something other than that, like, we can get it, but it'll take a month to get it. I was like, okay. It's like, what about meat? And he's like, yeah, we can get meat. And I'm like, what kind of meat? And he's like, whatever they can get on the boat. I'm like, huh, how do you keep it fresh? Because they just walk it onto the boat and then we kill it when it gets here. <laughs> so some, some constraints there as far as planning this job. We uh, never performed the job. We tendered the bid and the hotel company, to my understanding, never developed the island, which I think has its own kind of beauty to itself. You know, good. Let it be. That's just fine. Let it be. But, um, it was a really good planning exercise of having everything you need. Where's the guys going to sleep? There's no place to sleep. It was going to take about 40 men to do that project. Okay, this means bringing tents and cots and pillows and sheets and where are we going to poo and what is, how are we going to do laundry and you know how many pairs of socks does each man need to bring with it. I mean, planning all the way down. And uh, it was a really good exercise. And it was built around redundancy, knowing that we couldn't get, I, I couldn't get one more sheet metal screw if I needed it. Not one more. It doesn't exist. Not coming. It might be here in a month. Maybe. So, I would encourage y'all, first of all, thank you for hanging with me for 34 minutes. Uh, but also, uh, thanks for being here. And I would encourage y'all to inventory today what do your redundancies look like your transportation your water your food your security your combo your shelter your power your medical your intel i appreciate y'all stay warm have a blessed day shalom